Once again, I have learned a lot about 3D scanning and producing Gaussian splatting models. Even though I have been making these Gaussian models for some time, I'm just now starting to really understand what role the so-called sparse point cloud plays in the process. What happens when we combine material scanned with different cameras and what is the difference between point clouds that are implemented in different methods? Come along, I'll try to explain what I have been come up with. Hello boys and girls, it's Olli here once again. This time my 3D scanning wand led us to this environment where this beautiful ruined church is located. I figured that it was the perfect place to do a 3D scan and use not only my scanning stick but also an aerial image taken with a drone. Although the weather was really nice and sunny, it also brought certain challenges for the 3D scanning. I scanned the building both outside and inside, and since this church had no real roof on it, it was possible to see and photograph the interior parts also from the air. First, I did a scanning round from the ground, where I walked around the building with my scanning rod, which allowed me to record the building from three different heights at once. And as a separate take, I also scanned the interior of the church with this scanning stick. After that, I raised my DJI Air 2 drone up to the sky and first flew one round a little further away and then a little closer so that I could peek inside the church with the drone's excellent and stable camera. I also made a few additional clips of the parts that I thought needed a little extra coverage. The job was done relatively quickly and the actual scanning only took about half an hour. But even in that time a lot can happen, especially when other tourists and cars may suddenly appear to the location. And I'm really starting to understand now why scanning outdoor location like this should be done in overcast weather. The bright sunshine and the long dark shadows that covers the ground can turn amazingly fast, even though it felt like we were there only for a moment. For example, this table that I photographed inside the church was still in the sun, but when I started the drone shot a moment later, the large shadow had already moved over it. In that sense, the scanner stick where I have three separate cameras is a convenient tool because they all record the same moment simultaneously, and I don't have to worry about changes in the weather which would inevitably happen if each angle had to be recorded separately. But on the other hand, bright flares may also hit all cameras at some point during the scan, and these may create nasty floating artifacts later in the end result. Nevertheless, I decided to try what kind of a model this material would produce, and whether it is at all possible to combine the images taken from the outside and the inside, as well as the shots recorded from the air. And for this task, of course, I decided to use again the postcard program. I ended up producing a total of 12 separate video files, which I then dragged into postcard. The setting window suggested to me that we would use only a total of 1000 images from that entire material. I thought it sounded good, so I let Postshot choose the best photos and go with the default settings anyway. I used the new MCMC method and started the process. We should look at what happens at the different stages of the Postshot process. In the first image processing step, the program goes through the image sequences that were given to it. 
It selects the best and most usable images and then arranges them in the best order for the calculation. After this, the heaviest so-called camera tracking part begins, which takes surprisingly long time. This part, which is based on the call map architecture, the algorithm goes through the material frame by frame, tries to find suitable tracking points in the images and compares them to each other. When these points are placed in three-dimensional space and their coordinates can be estimated, the process is able to solve the position of the camera in the space at the moment when the picture was taken. And when enough camera angles starts to form, the algorithm can start the so-called structure from motion calculation, where the computer vision tries to generate a sparse point cloud from the shapes it sees. Only after this can the actual Gaussian splatting training begin, and depending on how many iteration steps were assigned to it, the Gaussian training parts take that much time. Typically, the time duration of the whole process is distributed like this, when the Gaussian model is trained to 30k steps, which is the default setting. The Gaussian model turned out to be pretty good, even at this default stage. I was pleasantly surprised that the process managed to connect the exterior and interior spaces together and produce a unified model of the entire church. Of course, a closer look also revealed some shortcomings and areas where the placement of the splats was not quite successful. That shadow movement problem that I pointed earlier appeared now as an interesting overlapping change, which only became visible when the viewing angle was tilted to certain height. But these areas can certainly be improved if we just increase the number of iteration steps and train the model further. Or at least I thought it would. I gave the process more time, increased the maximum number of splats and trained the model forward to higher iteration steps. I followed a couple of areas on the model where I hope to see some development, but the changes in accuracy were very slow and only very minor splat addition became visible. And it happened mainly in areas where I didn't expect them. For example, if you look closely at this lawn area, you'll notice how it gains accuracy with each iteration step, while this doorway inside the church remains fuzzy and unclear, and there isn't as much clear development in its accuracy. So this made me think that it must have something to do with the original sparse point cloud that lies under the Gaussians. A closer look revealed clear differences in the density of the point cloud, as it can be seen in here. The area of the lawn is in the sunlight and has a lot of dots, while the area on the shadow side has relatively few and is not covered as densely. So the density of the point cloud must play a significant role in how the distribution of splats is performed in the model and in which areas the accuracy can actually be increased. If there are clear gaps in the point cloud and only few reference points, the area remains mostly smudged and messy and the Gaussian splats do not have clear information about how they should be located in 3D space. So sparse point cloud works a bit like a gauge, which is then filled with splats of different sizes. Or another analogy of its function could be a sack of onions. You know, the kind of mesh bag where onions are usually sold. The density of the mesh bag holds onions and larger pieces pretty well, but it's easy to understand what happens if we start to fill this mess bag with smaller pieces like these tic tacs. Yeah, it doesn't hold them that well. 
so there must be some way to improve the quality of the sparse point cloud and make it more dense. And one way to do it is to use the Reality Capture software. Reality Capture is nowadays owned by the Epic Games company and it can be installed free through the same Epic Game Launcher as the Unreal Engine. It is by its origin a photogrammetry program, but as we know, making Gaussian splats and photogrammetry models uses the same principles to create a structure from motion. So, in post-start, it is possible to skip these first and time-consuming first steps and go straight to the Gaussian training if you just are able to produce the sparse point cloud and camera tracking in somewhere else. And now that we have seen what kind of a point clouds the open source cold map method produces, we can only hope that reality capture would make a better sparse point cloud. Based on what I've seen, Reality Capture is a very professional piece of software and it is able to produce very high quality and great looking 3D models from digital images. But in practice it's yet another very different app to learn. Its user interface is very quirky and the learning curve to get hang of it takes time. But I didn't come here to give up, so I decided to go for it and use the same thousand images that I already used in the first Gaussian model. The initial camera tracking phase is processed significantly faster than in the Colmap method, but Reality Capture rarely manages to produce one complete point cloud at once. Instead, after the first image alignment try, it often returns different parts of the scan, which are listed as a components in here. This components holds the partly built sparse cloud information of the images that Reality Capture managed to solve and track. And here it has separated the interior and exterior parts of the church. So now it is needed to tell the program how these parts are combined to each other and how they should be merged together. And it happens through these control points, with which you should tell the software that this corner and this point in the component is the same that can be seen in this other component. And through this method you should be able to merge them correctly. But Placing these control points turn out to be quite hard job and logic in activating them and understanding which points you are currently moving in the 3D space versus the 2D space where the source images are. So this can be pretty confusing. But several attempts later I finally managed to merge the components together. The final result was not totally perfect four frames from the original thousand images were misaligned, but it was so close that it should work. So now the next step was to export the necessary data out from Reality Capture so that it can be used in Gaussian splatting training in the post chart. And for that we need camera placement data which can be saved as a CSV file. It is a common spreadsheet format which only have the info of the coordinates where the cameras from the scan are located. And then we need the actual sparse point cloud in PLY format. When exporting point cloud, it is important to check that it is saved as a binary. So in the export window, this option needs to be turned to false. And finally, we are ready to produce a new Gaussian splatting model of this church. We just need to select the PLY file, the camera CSV, and the folder where the source images are, and drag these into the post shot. The setting window looks a bit different now, because the software recognized the camera tracking data and the already calculated sparse point cloud. So from here it is possible to change only basic parameters and then launch the process. 
this time the Gaussian training starts directly, so there is no need to wait for any image arrangement or camera tracking steps. You can start admiring how the splats are taking their places and how the Gaussian model forms itself. And now, with this sparse point cloud, training progress relatively much faster than before. The splats find their places much more lively, and the overall shape of the model begins to be seen already at quite low iteration steps. When we now inspect the same part of the model, it is comforting to notice that now there are many more points visible in this shaded area. So this version of sparse point cloud seems to be better than the previous one, and the work in reality capture was not in vain. But it also makes you think which makes more sense, after all, to wait a little longer by using the call map method in post or use the same time for fighting with control points and merging the components together by hand in reality capture. The answer is probably easy, but since the end result is clearly improved with reality capture, there are many advantages to producing sparse point cloud this way. And of course my skills will definitely improve further as I learn and get used to this reality capture more. All in all, this topic is interesting and not all of my theories are proven to be true. In practice there are still smudgy and soft gaps in the model, although I assumed that they would improve with additional and more dense point areas. So I have to put more effort into this in the future. It is also great to note that the research side is developing new ways to improve the call map method, and new interesting options for producing sparse point clouds are in the works. You can find the links of these papers in the description. I hope that this adventure in splat fields and 3D scanned locations was once again inspirational. Thank you if you watched this video so far. Like always, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. I'll prepare my scanning wand to the next experiment. Thanks for watching. Thank you.